Did you ever smoke a doofer with Willie Nelson? <laughs> Never did. Yeah, you don't have to smoke with Willie Nelson to smoke with Willie Nelson. <laughs> Speaking of collaborations, I have a bunch of Steve Martin questions, but this photo, Jerry Garcia, this photo, it looks like Steve Martin's making you guys laugh your asses off. <laughs> well, we were just laughing because it was a good time. Steve was emceeing in the Marin County Bluegrass Festival in 1974, the annual festival. Unfortunately, it was the only year that that happened. But, uh, Jerry Garcia was playing banjo with the group there he was, when he was off from the Grateful Dead. And Steve was emceeing and I was playing with the Dirt Band. And the photographer caught a magic moment. Boy. You worked with Dolly Parton when she was on Steve Martin's record, I think, you, which you well, produced. I produced the album of Steve Martin. It's called The Crow, and it won a Grammy. I got Vince Gill and Dolly Parton to sing together on it. And I got a few other people, and I got Earl Scruggs to play on it, and, and a couple other people. Mary Black in Ireland, Ireland's Emmy Lou Harris, you might say. Oh, cool. And it was really fun, because I, I say, who's your favorite female singer? And he goes, I really like Mary Black. She's an Irish singer. Yeah, I know who Mary Black is. Oh, do you know her? I said, no. This, we'll, we'll have her sing Calico. He goes, well, how can, we, how can you say that? How do you know she'd want to do it? Well, Steve, I'm just guessing that she'd want to do it. Excuse me, but because I have a credibility in Ireland, and you do, too. I got her email, and I sent it out that night, and by the next day, I had a yes. Well, Mary's in. Now I want to get Vince and Dolly to sing Pretty Flowers. Well, how are you going to get Vince? I go, Steve, just a minute. Hello, Vince. Yeah, I'm producing an album on Steve. Martin and wanted to know if you'd want to sing one of the songs. It's a really nice old country sounding song called Pretty Flowers. Okay, I'll send it to you. Bye. Vince is in. <laughs> yeah, he said to it. Why not? You know? And Dolly, I had to send the fax to because she put a new email. And right. I hadn't had a number on her in several years. I'd opened for her 40 times or more. Or Oh my gosh, oh, Dolly oh. Parton. I offered to introduce her, you know. And now here they are, Dolly Parton. <laughs> she must be an amazing person to hang out with and work with. She is just amazing. I mean, she's she's a wonderful songwriter, a wonderful entertainer, a smart businesswoman that changed the way country music was working. I mean, I remember years ago, she goes, I said, Dolly, what are you going to do? What's your future like? Well, John McEwen, let me tell you, I'm going to open my, my own makeup line because it costs a lot of money to look this cheap. And <laughs> She's so funny. I'm going to star in a movie. I don't know what it is yet, but I'll be a star in it and something to do with 9 to 5. 9 to 5. And and a play. I got There's a play on the line. And then I'm going to open an amusement park. How do you? What do you think of the name Dollywood? Isn't that cute? Dollywood. Man, and Dollywood wasn't open, wasn't even talked about yet. Right, it was in her head, and she wrote, "Well, I will always love you," which was a big hit for her. But who knew Whitney Houston was going to rip that song apart? Boy, she's had so many huge hits like that, um, and, and yet seems like a gracious, wonderful person too. At the same time, Linda Ronstadt's very much the same, although not quite as accomplished on the business side, although she's coming around with uh, some cool things. But Linda is a sweet young, sweet young. None of us are young now, but young at heart. She used to hang out at the Troubadour, where the Dirt Band started, kind of. And wow. uh, I talked to her last year, and yeah, I can't sing anymore, but I can't hit those high notes and anyway. But her attitude was wonderful. Man, Blue Bayou. Yeah, still. Been, you know, I was in a studio in the late 60s, laying on the floor of a vocal booth at a session that Linda was doing. And if you were in 
the music business. And it didn't matter if you were successful or unsuccessful back in the 60s and early 70s. If somebody was recording and you knew them, you could drop by. It didn't matter if it was Poco or some of the other people. Uh, Lynn Ronstadt's recording over on Ventura. So I was hanging out there because there was free food at the studio. <laughs> hey, <laughs> there was not a lot of money for food, but there wasn't a lot of money for anything. I was laying on the floor of the vocal booth and listening through headphones to what had been recorded. And she came out and go, hey, John, I want to sing a song. I got to sing in the vocal. And I says, oh, well, I'll leave the vocal booth. And she goes, no, you can stay there. I'll sing it to you. And she sang that song, Will You Still Love Me Tomorrow, you know? Right, yeah. Will you still love me tomorrow? Just standing there with the headphones. I can't hear any of the track. I just hear her voice. And I'm going, yes, Linda, I will, you know? But <laughs> yes, whatever you say. <laughs> we did some shows with her later on, and she was always just sweet. She recorded with us a couple times. Something Bob Dylan said to you had a big impact on your musical career, right? I, I don't know Bob Dylan. I know the periphery of Bob Dylan, you know, from over here. Right, right. I would booked a day off with the Dirt Band on the road. We were in Florida. I wanted to go see Dylan in the Rolling Thunder Review in the mid-80s. was uh, playing in Lakeland, Florida. And I went to the sound check. It's easy to get into a, a concert if you go at sound check time, which is usually four o'clock. I'm standing up by the front of the stage with my arms on the stage watching Dylan and Joan Baez, uh, a couple of band members, two or three roadies, trying, wow. to figure, trying to figure out how to get Joni's guitar plugged in to the direct box right so it could be heard in the PA. And they're messing around, they're plugging in. And I happen to have the same direct box. Right, you know exactly what they're supposed to be doing. <laughs> Take the cord and plug it in the front hole on the left. And Bob looked at me and goes, it was like this. He said, do what he said. <laughs> <laughs> Man, I'd love Bob Dylan to say that about something I said. Yeah. <laughs> When I was uh, 19, I was part of a promotion. Uh, I, I put up money to do a Bob Dylan concert in Long Beach and made enough to buy a new banjo. And it was a good deal. And now you have a signature banjo, like a company actually made a John McEwen banjo, right? Yeah. My cool 1927 Florentine banjo was getting torn up on the road. And Deering offered to make me a signature model daring banjo and it really sounds good it's really a cool banjo yeah a john McHugh model has my name on it here i'm gonna ask you willie nelson he's a legend he's a great guy he's a proponent of legalizing it so i have to ask you did you ever smoke a doofer with willie nelson <laughs> never did yeah you don't have to smoke with willie nelson to smoke with Billy nelson <laughs> It's in the same room on the bus or something, and you just catch it from him. Yeah, I, I'll He's... never forget going onto his bus one time. Willie is on the phone, on a stationary bike, and he's smoking a joint. <laughs> it didn't. It was like this is too weird. He was, was very, on the phone, on a smoking joint, talking to his manager. Man, that's amazing. Talk about multitasking. Okay, speaking of doobies, the Doobie Brothers. Those guys jam. You played with them a few times, right? A couple times I played with the Doobie Brothers. I, I owe John McPhee a, a, a nice thank you because because of him, I play a Zeta fiddle, Z-E-T-A. One of the best fiddles out there for plugging in and playing and it's a great instrument made by a guy in Phoenix. One time the Dirt Band was doing a show with the Doobies and our bus didn't show up. I had to go to two different music stores to rent a bunch of equipment. I rented the stuff, got it there, couldn't find a fiddle. 
I'd never met John McPhee. We had done a show or two with him, but you don't always meet the group you play with. I went up to him and said, do you think I could use your fiddle for a few songs? He goes, yeah, you're welcome to it. I didn't realize he was a fan. He was a fan and I appreciated that. After the show, I went, "What? what that's a great instrument. What is it? And he told me and gave me the number of the guy that made it. It's a great fiddle. Um, I didn't realize that he had such an impact on what on the fiddle that you use. And you're a multi instrumentalist. You, you know, in addition to playing banjo, oh, you play yeah. mandolin, fiddle, and just straight guitar too, right? Yeah, and lap slide guitar. You know, one you can play with a bar, a little old fashioned six string kind. But your favorite instrument is is banjo still. Well, it depends on the song. Sometimes it's the the musical tone of a mandolin fits right in. Sometimes an open tuning guitar, like on the Dirt Band's first number one song, was Long Hard Road, a song written by Rodney Crowell. He had sent it to me and said, I think the band ought to do this. And I agreed with him and played it for him. And they agreed. And I played it in a D tuning, open D. And when I started playing that and Jimmy Ibbotson started singing, I actually said, this is going to be on the radio. I felt that all the way through the song, but not in an arrogant way, in a good way to where you felt like you were doing the job of making music for the public, you know, for people. And it was an important song. It was a magic moment. Well, Long Hard Road was a magic lyric that Rodney puts together, just like an American Dream, which is another song, the one that Jeff and Linda sang together, Ronstadt. It, it, it's only been about five times I felt in the studio that I was playing on a hit that was coming from us, maybe six. Well, one time was King Tut. <laughs> yes. Fans of Steve Martin know him as a comedic star, the jerk, the man with two brains. But you, John, know him as your good friend since high school. Well, we met at 16 years old, trying to get a job in Disneyland Magic Shop. We got the job on the same day in the uh, spring of 63, I think it was. The whole summer was wonderful. It was 12 hour days, five or six days a week. It was just really a lot of fun. We did it that for, for three years. About two years into that is when the banjo came along. Did you get to play banjo at the parks at all? No, no, I, I was just learning. I was 17 and a half. Yeah, I was stumped on clunk, 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 you know. You were a little bit better than Steve though, cause you were both picking it up at the same time and you were sort of teaching him. Correct? I don't like to say I was better because I think he's great at what he does. And that's why I produced his album, The Crow. It's a wonderful record. He's just, he was a little slower. I was a little faster one way or the other. It's nice enough to say that I started teaching him. As much as anybody could teach him, I guess I did. He'd go like this, Duncan, 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 Duncan. Yeah, that's right, Steve. He'd go, okay, Duncan, Duncan, blah, 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 blah. You know, he just messed it up. <laughs> did now did you go to his house to give him lessons or did he go to your house or were you not you weren't really giving him lessons yeah, not really lessons just we saw each other a lot we worked in the magic shop together we he came over after work which was usually around midnight or one in the morning and he would come in for 15 minutes and say hey what do you think of this joke and and then i say, yeah what do you think of this lick and so he was working on comedy at that time. He didn't start working on comedy till after college, kind of. When he was 20 years old or so, he got a job writing for the Smothers Brothers, writing for the Cher Show and then Glenn Campbell. We had lunch one day, I think it was 1969, and he goes, I'm going to quit writing. I'm going to work on my own act. And I says, well, that sounds great, Steve. Says, yeah, but I've only got five minutes. No, I've got eight minutes. You know, he only had eight minutes of a show. He had to write a show. And he did. Um, so I have to ask you, did you guys go searching for banjo records at, like, music stores? Are you a record collector? I was then. Uh, we would find things. He'd, he'd say, hey, I just found this new record. Or I'd say, hey, you got to get this record. You know, it was different then. You'd get a record in the record store, and you'd, you could take it and listen to it, and then go, yeah, I like that. I'll take it home. Or you could just pick it up. And and there weren't as many records. And it wasn't like, oh, let me Google that. 
Right, yeah, you had to jump on it. If you found one, you might not be able to find it again. Yeah, and you trade them. You, I mean, you, here, borrow this record for a while. Okay, make sure I get it back. So we did a little bit of that. It worked out pretty good. And Steve, when he hosted The Tonight Show, he had you on as a guest. The Nitty Gritty Dirt Band, and he works on his own. His name is John McEwen, and he's a friend of, close personal friend of mine. Yeah, I did it. We did it twice, I think. I did it once with Leatherman and once with Steve. Is and like, is that nerve wracking? <laughs> yes. Because <laughs> you know, like three million people are watching or something. At that time, it was more like fifteen million. A bad night would be twelve million. <laughs> but Carson usually did really well. You didn't ha make any mistakes though, so that's good. I watched the performances. You have? Yeah. Well. They're on YouTube. You can watch them, ballers. I'll put links in the description. Then Steve said, would you play on our King Tut record, like you said? That was the Dirt Band. Yeah, but it wasn't like that, quite. It was, my brother was managing Steve. He was also managing the Dirt Band. He had a studio in Aspen. We were going to Aspen. Steve lived in Aspen. The week before we recorded, he was in LA teaching us a song. Going, go King Tut, King Tut, King Tut, and, and bass, go thum, 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 thum. We did it that night at the Dorothy Chandler Pavilion in front of 2,200 people. And boy, <laughs> nice. they went crazy. He did the walk and everything, you know, the, uh, and, uh, this was the night that he taught it to you before you'd recorded it or anything. Right, the night he taught it to us, we went on the stage and did it. Wow. And well, it's, it's not that complicated of a song, but then a week later we're in Aspen, and Steve didn't know any musicians really. Uh, any in Aspen? Uh, well, he knew a few, but anyway, it was more like, hey, let's get together in the studio and, and lay down King Tut. My brother, being the guy administrating that. And you recorded it and mixed it, everything, all in about nine hours, in uh, eight or nine hours, which was quick for a, a song like that. Now, the Circle album, we did 36 songs in six days. That was mm -hmm. quick. That was real quick.